Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Oh, welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and look, it's Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. I'm here. We had Egg McMuffins. We did. A bacon and egg McMuffins. I don't usually eat those regularly, but when I do, it's a nice treat. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Grace Marks and James McDermott, servants of Thomas Kinnear in Richmond Hill, Ontario, became notorious for the 1843 murder of their employer and his housekeeper, Nancy Montgomery. Grace claimed she was present during the murders but didn't directly participate, but the courts disagreed. The motive behind the murders was reportedly theft and the desire to start a new life. The pair escaped to Toronto, intending to flee to the United States and marry. However, they were arrested in Lewiston, New York, and returned to Toronto. McDermott was executed, while Grace, after public debate about her involvement in gender, had her death sentence commuted to life imprisonment. She was pardoned and released after almost 30 years behind bars. This is Dark Poutine Episode 278, Murder in Richmond Hill, The Crimes of Grace Marks and James McDermott. Much of the following story comes from the confessions of Grace Marks and James McDermott given before their trial. Later, the author Susanna Moody, in her 1853 book, Life in the Clearings vs. the Bush, released conversations she claimed she had with both James and Grace. In all the narratives, each suspect pointed the finger right at the other. Grace said James had concocted the plan and was the sole perpetrator in the murders. In his confession, James claims Grace had devised the plan to murder Kinnear and Montgomery and that Grace had been the one to kill Nancy Montgomery. We'll share all the narratives, but there are issues with them. Grace's telling of the tale was most likely skewed to keep her out of the hangman's noose, as was James. The one told in Moody's book might be an author's embellishment, or worse, entirely fabricated. The truth, as in all of these historical cases, where all the participants, victims, witnesses, and perpetrators are long dead, is lost to time. Born around 1828 in Northern Ireland, Grace Marks was one of nine children in the family. She had four brothers and four sisters, was the oldest of the Marks' daughters, and had one older brother. Her family's exact circumstances in Ireland are not well documented, but it is known that they faced a degree of poverty and hardship, common for many Irish families in that era, especially in the years leading up to the Great Famine. 
The Great Famine, also known as the Irish Potato Famine, or On Gorta Moor, was a period of mass starvation, disease, and, and emigration from Ireland between 1845 and 1852. The famine is considered one of the darkest periods in Irish history, resulting in the death of approximately one million people and the emigration of another million, causing the country's population to fall by 20 to 25 percent. The main cause of the famine was a potato disease known as potato blight. The disease destroys the leaves and edible roots of the potato plant. It was first reported in Ireland in September 1845. The consequences were devastating with many Irish people, especially the rural poor, dependent on the potato as a dietary staple. The blight returned in 1846, resulting in a near total crop failure and leading to severe food shortages. Social, political, and economic factors exacerbated the situation. Britain's long-standing policy of absentee landlordism meant that many Irish peasants rented their lands from landlords who lived in England and had little to no connection to the land or people. These landlords often evicted tenants who couldn't pay their rent, leading to widespread homelessness and further destitution. Additionally, even as the people starved, Ireland was forced to export food to Britain due to economic policies rooted in laissez-faire capitalism. The British government's response to the crisis was insufficient and often hindered more than it helped. Initial relief efforts were inadequate and later policies like the public works program often resulted in exploitation rather than effective aid. This period saw a rise in disease with outbreaks of cholera, typhus, and other illnesses further increasing the death toll. You know, I mean, this is interesting here. Um, with with the, these, this crisis, there's lots of re reasons given yeah. um, to, from the left, from the right, from the center, right? And mm -hmm. sort of why it happened. And, you know, I think, you know, sometimes when some people are blaming lazy fair capitalism, I think I feel that that actually allows the politicians, the government, the landlords sort of, sort of off the hook. Yes. Right. Is the system because actually that system of having these feudal landlords, that's not laissez faire capitalism, right? So it, so it, it's, it's kind of not that. But then, then, you know, the second part that you said there was when the government did get involved, right? It wasn't working and made things work. So right. then you have the right kind of going. Well, that's what happens when you have government intervention. Right. And the point is, this was an emergency, right? Yeah. yeah. And when you have an emergency like this and people are like dying, you, you throw that stuff out the window and you get immediate help for people. Yeah. And, you know, I think what one thing is abundantly clear, that people in Whitehall were dicks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's a technical term. Sure. <laughs> and um, th they should have been helped right away. And we're seeing it happening here in Canada with the housing crisis right now. We're having like an influx of immigrants mm. coming very quickly to the country. And where are they going to live? People who are refugee claimants are living on the streets in greater mm -hmm. Toronto right now. It's kind of reminiscent of what you just said. Yeah. And, and, you know, people have opinions and you know, mine generally. Yeah. Like cut red tape, let people build. Yeah. Right? Just get, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Yeah. Either that or look, like do the whole social housing thing like they do in the UK. No, yeah, just get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Famine had a lasting impact on Ireland socially, demographically, and politically. The trauma of the famine and its aftermath increased Irish nationalism and resentment toward British rule, contributing to the eventual struggle for Irish independence. Much of the massive emigration to North America also fundamentally altered the global Irish diaspora. In the early 1840s, the Marx family decided to immigrate to Canada, hoping for a better life. The journey was fraught with difficulty, the most significant being the death of Grace's mother during the voyage. Once in Canada, the Marks family settled in Toronto where they continued to live in near poverty. Her father, John, a skilled stonemason, struggled to find consistent work. The Marks children had to go to work at an early age. This is the same time period that the Donnellys came over. Mm -hmm. R remember, uh, we, sure. we did the Donnelly family massacre in right. episode 208? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, they were part of that diaspora, the Irish diaspora that moved. Yeah, yeah, yeah they the both time. moved in the 1840s. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Young and with little formal education, Grace sought work as a domestic servant, a common occupation for women in her position at the time. Her earliest employments are not well documented, but she later said that she had worked in several households around Toronto, including those of Alderman Dixon, Mr. McManus, Mr. Coates, and Mr. Haragi. She was generally considered a hard worker, but also developed a reputation for petty theft. According to Susanna Moody's book, before his execution, James McDermott said that Grace was an attractive, smart working girl with rather quiet and moody disposition. It was hard to tell when she was actually happy. In 1843, when Grace was around 15 years old, she secured a position at the Richmond Hill estate of Thomas Kinnear, a wealthy farmer and bachelor. She moved in to live with Thomas Watson. She had moved in to live with Thomas Watson, a shoemaker on Lot Street in June, but Nancy Montgomery, who often visited there, met Grace and took a shine to her. Nancy hired the plucky young girl away from the shoemaker, offering her a position as a servant for Kinnear at a wage of $3 a month. That would have been three pounds a month at the time. R correct. Uh, British pounds was used until 1858 in Canada. 1858. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I got it wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> Kinnear's farm was in Richmond Hill. In the 1840s, Richmond Hill was a small and growing community. It was predominantly agricultural with farms and orchards spread throughout the area. Many of the families living there were of British descent, having emigrated from the UK, although other cultural backgrounds were also represented. It was a time when the city was just beginning to develop. The area consisted mainly of wooden structures, including residences, stores, a school, and churches. Young Street, which cut through the town, was an important transportation route connecting Lake Ontario to Lake Simcoe and was key to the town's early growth and development. The population was still small during this time, with families living on relatively large plots of land. People in Richmond Hill primarily engaged in farming activities, with some also involved in local trades and crafts such as blacksmithing, carpentry, and shoemaking. Life in Richmond Hill during the 1840s would have been characterized by hard work, with the day-to-day -day revolving around farming and other manual labor. However, community and social activities would also have played a role, with church services, social gatherings, and community events offering opportunities for recreation and socialization. Overall, it was a time of change and growth for Richmond Hill. The following decades would see the community transform from a largely agricultural settlement to a bustling city. And indeed, now it's just a part of the GTA, Greater right. Toronto Area. Yeah. Which is a city of 7 million people. Yeah, biggest city in Canada. The six. The, yeah. Thomas Kinnear was a good-looking, well-off gentleman farmer who resided north of Richmond Hill Village on Young Street. He was described as living a comfortable and self-indulgent lifestyle. Grace Marks started working at the Kinnear Estate at the beginning of July 1843, and she met James McDermott, a 20-year-old Irish Catholic, on the first day at the house. McDermott had been there only about a week and was employed as a stable hand. McDermott was a somewhat older Irish immigrant with a reputation for having a volatile temper but he seemed to like Grace and the pair bonded over their shared heritage. Grace learned that Thomas had left home to become a soldier and had been stationed in Quebec. After his regiment disbanded, no longer keen on being told what to do, he left the army. He then traveled to Toronto and eventually into the employ of Thomas Kinnear. Grace learned quickly that Thomas Kinnear clearly favored Nancy Montgomery, and she was the de facto disciplinarian of the other servants in the house. Grace quickly grew to hate her, as had James McDermott. Once the day's tasks were completed, Grace Marks and James McDermott were often left alone in the kitchen, as Nancy, the housekeeper, seemed wholly preoccupied with Thomas Kinnear. A relationship soon blossomed between James and Grace as they commiserated over their treatment. Nancy and Thomas seemed much closer than employer and employee. James told Grace that he was sure that Kinnear and Nancy were sharing a bed. Grace confirmed McDermott's suspicions. She wondered the same thing. When Grace moved in, she was told she'd share a bed with Nancy. However, the only time Nancy and Grace did share a bed was on nights when Thomas Kinnear was not home. 
It was known to a few in the neighborhood that Kinnear was in a common-law relationship with his attractive housekeeper, Nancy Montgomery. While this non-traditional relationship excluded them from the local social scene, they nonetheless seemed to enjoy a content life together. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia.ca, as one account stated, the relation between the two seems to have been rather less than kin and considerably more than kind. Grace frequently lashed out at Nancy with insolence and disrespect. She consistently vented to James about this inequality between her and Nancy. She often questioned why Nancy should be treated like a lady, enjoying the finest things, asserting that there was no difference in their birth status or education. She told James that she wouldn't tolerate being belittled by Nancy for much longer, stating that one of them would have to go. Mm. I find this fascinating, uh, how Grace didn't accept the dynamic of the fact that essentially they were a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, they actually were a couple. They were right? a couple behind closed doors, mostly. Right. But yeah. they were a couple, and and yeah. it, this is a, this is an insight in the class structure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and the fact that you know Nancy, for all intents and purposes, was Thomas's common law wife, his partner. Yep. Because she was originally from a different social state, Grace couldn't wrap her head around the fact that this was acceptable. Right. Right? Um, like, imagine, Mike, if you, you had a partner from, like, a, a wealthier family or, like, a better education, and you had somebody cleaning your house that just sort of, like, was insolent to you because you didn't, you weren't in your place, right? And you, like, have a house together. <laughs> yeah, that would make me a bit crazy. Yeah, it's sort of the same thing, right? Yeah. In his confession, painting himself as the innocent, James said, Grace and the housekeeper used often to quarrel, and she told me she was determined if I would assist her, she would poison both the housekeeper and Mr. Kinnear by mixing poison with the porridge. I told her I would not consent to anything of the kind. End quote. During the first two weeks of Grace's employment, there were several instances where Nancy scolded McDermott for not doing his work properly. James claimed Grace had a knack for taking any small grievance Nancy made against him and escalating it, fueling James's frustration until he started viewing Nancy as a mutual adversary. James was drawn to Grace thanks to her good looks, but also said that even though there was something off-putting about her, he still found her attractive. Grace was coy, aloof, and haughty, offering a challenge to James. He tried to win her over by sympathizing with her discontent and grievances against Nancy Montgomery. James and Grace began plotting after learning Kinnear was heading into Toronto to collect his salary and would be out of the house. It would be easier to take care of them, one at a time. Kinnear told Nancy that he'd be back by midday the following day. According to James, Nancy was sick of Grace's insubordination and told her to be out of the house by the end of the month. James said he'd already spoken with Kinnear, giving him his notice as well, as he couldn't take Nancy's dictatorial ways any longer. James said he'd told Kinnear he'd finish the month. In her later confession, Grace gave a different accounting. She said that Nancy had told only James that she was giving him two weeks of notice to find work and for her to find replacements for him. Nancy, Grace said, told James that he had to leave once his month was up, and Nancy said she would pay him his wages on his final day. Placing herself in a place of complete innocence in her confession, Grace later said that James confided in her that he was glad to leave, as he no longer wanted to live with Kinnear and Montgomery, whom he called wretches. James, Grace said, was resentful and desired some form of revenge before he left. Grace claimed that James had disclosed to her that if she could keep a secret, he would tell her what he planned to do with Mr. Kinnear and Nancy. She promised to keep his secret. He then revealed that Mr. Kinnear was about to head to the city and would likely bring back a significant amount of money. McDermott told Grace he planned to kill Nancy before Kinnear returned, shoot Kinnear when he came back, and then steal all the money and valuables he could before fleeing to the United States. James said Grace was livid that she'd been fired and wanted revenge. In James McDermott's confession, he said Grace told him, quote, A few days before Mr. Kinnear went into town, the housekeeper had given her warning to leave, and she told me, Now, McDermott, I'm not going to leave in this way. Let us poison Mr. Kinnear and Nancy. I know how to do it. I'll put some poison in the porridge. By that means, we can get rid of them. 
We can plunder the house, pack the silver and other valuables in some boxes, and go over to the States. I said, no, Grace, I will not do so. When Mr. Kinnear went to the city Thursday, she commenced packing up some of the things and told me I was a coward for not assisting her. End quote. It was a fact that Mr. Kinnear left for the city on Thursday afternoon, the 27th of July, around 3 o'clock, on horseback. That same afternoon, Nancy left the house to visit friends. In Moody's book, James said that Grace and he were left alone in the house. Instead of focusing on their chores, they indulged in Kinnear's whiskey, rehashing their perceived injustices. James admitted that at the time, he'd made a pass at Grace, but she was focused on her resentment toward Nancy and her desire for revenge. James claimed that is when he jokingly suggested that he could end Nancy's life if that's what Grace wanted. James was allegedly stunned when Grace took his suggestion seriously. He said that she challenged his courage, goading him to kill Nancy for her. James said he told Grace he would consider it if she promised to elope with him afterwards. James said Grace agreed and that Nancy must be killed first. James said that he questioned Grace's earnestness and how they could do the act without getting caught. Apparently, Grace suggested James wait until Nancy was asleep and then kill her with an axe blow to the head. As Grace shared a bed with Nancy, she volunteered to ensure the door to the room was unlocked so that he could get inside easily. According to Susanna Moody's 1853 chapter on the case, James McDermott said, I looked at her with astonishment. Good God, I thought, can this be a woman? A pretty soft-looking woman, too, and a mere girl. What a heart she must have. I felt equally tempered to tell her she was a devil and that I would have nothing to do with such a horrible piece of business. But she looked so handsome that somehow or another I yielded to the temptation, though it was not without a struggle, for conscience loudly warned me not to injure one who had never injured me. End quote. Nancy returned for supper and was unexpectedly amiable, joining Grace and James in the kitchen. James said that Grace played along, hiding her malevolent thoughts. That evening, a boy named James Walsh visited, bringing along his flute. Nancy suggested that they have some fun in Kinnear's absence. However, Grace later claimed that McDermott was in a sour mood all evening and refused to dance. After Walsh left, Grace and Nancy went to bed like best friends. James sat alone in the kitchen with his axe and worked up the courage for his terrible act. Summoning his resolve, James approached the bedroom door, which was accessible from the kitchen. The door was open as Grace had promised. The moonlight illuminated the room, allowing James to see the faces of Grace and Nancy as they lay there. Grace seemed to be asleep or pretending to be, while Nancy lay in a position ideal for the intended act. James raised his axe, but felt like an invisible force, perhaps God, held back his arm. James abandoned the attempt and retreated to the kitchen, cursing his own weakness. He made several more attempts, but was thwarted each time as if some divine power protected Nancy. After his ninth attempt, James gave up and swore that she would live as long as he was her only threat. Frustrated, James threw the axe onto the woodpile in the shed, retired to bed, and fell asleep. Grace again told a different story. She said that she and Nancy went to bed around 10 o'clock. Before they retired, James took Grace aside and reiterated his intention to kill Nancy that night with the axe while she was in bed. Grace claimed she had pleaded with him not to do so, fearing that he might strike her instead. He then apparently declared that he would kill Nancy the following morning. Regardless of how it went down that evening, the next sunrise was Nancy Montgomery's last. More after a quick break. And we are back. Uh, Matthew comments. A lot of he said, she said. Yeah, well, that's why I wrote it this way, because the truth, I don't know where the heck it lies. It, it's just like, okay, so he said, this is what happened. And she said, this is what happened. Yeah. yeah. That's often the, uh, the problem, or I was going to say the fun, but the problem with these really old cases sure. is we will never know. No. Right? Grace said that on Saturday morning she woke up early. She found James McDermott in the home's back kitchen cleaning his shoes by the light of the fire. When he asked about Nancy, 
She told him that Nancy was getting dressed and asked if he planned to kill her that morning. James confirmed his intentions. Grace claimed that she wanted no part in the murder of Nancy and pleaded with him not to murder her in their room as her blood would stain the floor. James, she said, promised he'd make sure Nancy was outside when he killed her. Again, the two stories are not exactly parallel. James said he was in the kitchen tending the fire. He claimed Grace Marks was already in there, pails in hand, ready to milk the cows. As she sauntered past, she prodded him in the ribs with her pail and murmured, What a coward you are. According to Susanna Moody's book, James said, quote, As she uttered those words, The devil, against whom I had fought all night, entered into my heart and transformed me into a demon. All feelings of remorse and mercy forsook me from that instant and darker and deeper plans of murder and theft flashed through my brain. Go and milk the cows, said I with a bitter laugh, and you shall soon see whether I am the coward you take me for. She went out to milk, and I went to murder the unsuspicious housekeeper. End quote. Oh, that devil, Mike. Oh, the devil. It was all the devil's fault. He's responsible for a lot of things in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And what's funny is this is like, what, the 1800s. People still use that excuse. Yeah. (laughs) The devil made me do it. Yeah, well. (laughs) There was a demon in me. No, it's it's you. (laughs) James went outside to retrieve his axe and returned to the house's main kitchen. Grace, he said, was still outside milking the cows. In Moody's narrative of the crime, James allegedly found Nancy at the sink, washing her face in a tin basin. Armed with his deadly axe, James didn't hesitate. He dealt her a forceful blow to the back of her head. She collapsed silently at his feet. Opening the trapdoor leading to the basement where the household food and other supplies were stored, James tossed her lifeless body down, shut the door, and wiped the sweat trickling down his face. Looking at the axe, he laughed. I've got a taste for blood now, and this won't be the last murder. Grace Marks, you've awakened the beast. Look out for yourself now! Exclamation <laughs> mark. Have you ever seen one of those trap doors in a house in a kitchen? I have, yeah. I think I think it was my great grandparents that had one. I can remember mm-hmm. lifting it up and going down super steep stairs. Yeah, and often in pubs in in London. Mm-hmm. They have one, and they go it's down. Where, yeah, they store everything down there. And I have seen a bartender not realize that it's open and, <laughs> and walking across and suddenly disappear in front of me. Whoops. Whoops. We still, uh, they used one of those in Shaun of the Dead in the pub. Oh, the, did the they? The Winchester, yeah. Yeah, most pubs have them. It's yeah. funny. Grace gave a few other details. She said that she left for the garden to gather some chives and returned to find McDermott cleaning knives in the back kitchen where Nancy had just entered. Nancy told Grace to prepare breakfast and sent her to the pump for water. While at the pump, Grace turned to see McDermott dragging Nancy across the yard from the back kitchen to the front kitchen. It was about 7 o'clock. Grace claimed to be surprised that McDermott had acted so quickly. James had said it was better to get it over with and reminded her that she promised to help him. He told her to open the trap door so he could throw Nancy into the cellar. She claimed she was too frightened to comply. After a few minutes, James told her that he had put Nancy in the cellar and asked for a handkerchief. She asked why, and he cryptically replied that Nancy wasn't dead yet. She gave him a piece of white cloth and followed him to the trap door. He descended the stairs to the cellar, leaving Grace upstairs. After a few minutes, he emerged. Grace asked if Nancy was dead, and James confirmed that she was. James told her that he'd hidden Nancy's body behind some barrels. He told her, Grace, I know you'll tell. If you do, your life is not worth a straw. End quote. James said it was Grace who'd gone down into the cellar. He had not, implying it was Grace Marks who'd strangled Nancy. As James refused to give further details about the murders, we must rely on Grace's accounting, for what it's worth. Following Nancy's death, Grace said McDermott ate breakfast, but she was too shocked to eat anything. James then pointed out that Mr. Kinnear would soon be home, and, since there was no gunpowder in the house, he decided to go over to a neighbor's home to fetch some. Upon his return, he produced a bullet from his pocket and fashioned another from a piece of lead he'd found in the house. Mr. Kinnear arrived home around 11 o'clock in his one-horse wagon. As usual, McDermott took charge of the horse and wagon while Grace removed the parcels. 
Mr. Kinnear asked about Nancy and Grace lied, telling him that Nancy had gone into town. Kinnear expressed surprise as he'd passed the stage on the road and he hadn't seen her. He didn't mention Nancy's name to Grace afterward. When Grace asked Mr. Kinnear if he wanted anything to eat, he inquired whether there was any fresh meat, asking if the butcher had been there. She informed him that he had not, to which he responded with surprise. He then requested tea, toast, and eggs, which Grace prepared for him. Mr. Kinnear returned to the dining room, sat on the sofa, and started reading a book he had brought with him. When Grace went into the kitchen, McDermott was there. He declared his intention to kill Mr. Kinnear then. But Grace insisted that it was too soon and asked him to wait until after it was dark. Grace said she would help him after that. James was concerned that if someone else arrived to visit, he would lose his opportunity to kill Kinnear. After resting briefly, Thomas Kinnear got up and went outside to take care of some work. While Mr. Kinnear was in the yard, McDermott stayed in the house with Grace, prompting her to caution James that his behavior might arouse Mr. Kinnear's suspicions. Early in the evening, Grace was on her way to Mr. Kinnear's room to clear away some things, she said. As she entered the front room, McDermott announced his plan to kill Mr. Kinnear and instructed her to call him. Mr. Kinnear was sitting on the sofa reading again. Grace refused and proceeded to the back kitchen, which was situated in the yard adjacent to the end of the house, to put away the tea tray. Suddenly, Grace heard a gunshot. She rushed into the kitchen and saw Mr. Kinnear lying dead on the floor, with McDermott standing over him, a double-barreled gun on the floor beside him. On witnessing this, Grace attempted to flee. However, McDermott ordered her to return and open the trap door. Although she initially resisted, remembering her promise, Grace complied and opened the trap door. McDermott then threw the body down into the cellar. Frightened, Grace ran out the front door, onto the lawn, and circled back into the back kitchen. As Grace stood at the door, McDermott shot at her from the kitchen to the yard. The bullet missed her, lodging in the door jam instead. It was later found there by police. Okay, so this right there mm -hmm. is a piece of evidence that kind of starts swaying me to believing that a little bit more of Grace's side of this story. Hmm. Right, this is hard evidence. There's there's a bullet hole in that door. There's a bullet lodged in the door jam. Yeah. But who knows what was going on between the two of them when the, that shot was fired. Hmm. Some people believe it was Grace that fired that shot. Oh, really? So, you know. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway. Anyway. I, I think I'm, I just, you know. Yeah. I think I just want to support grace sure like, i have like evidence or not i'm just like eh. so you're team grace yeah at this i just point. want to be team grace yeah. like, I, I have nothing to back it up but uh, <laughs> i like her name <laughs> exactly grace said at this point she fainted and when she regained consciousness mcdermott was beside her she asked why he'd shot at her to which he replied that he hadn't intended to harm her and that he had assumed the gun was empty James told Grace that if anyone inquired about the gunshot, he would claim that he had been shooting birds. I don't really buy that. No? <laughs> it's the 1800s. Yeah. It, it, you know, you have a gun in your hand probably every day. Sure. Right? It's not like people today, oh, I didn't know it was loaded. Because they haven't picked up a gun in a year and a half. <laughs> right. Right? It was around 8 o'clock when James Walsh, the young man who'd visited the night before, entered the yard. Grace spoke with Walsh, and noticing this, McDermott joined them. Walsh would later testify at the couple's trials that he was suspicious. On his arrival, he'd seen James McDermott, without a jacket, crossing the yard, holding a rifle, and entering the poultry yard. Walsh asked where Nancy was, and Grace responded that Nancy had gone to a neighbor's on Kinnear's horse. Walsh asked about Mr. Kinnear, and James McDermott told him that Mr. Kinnear wasn't home either. When Walsh inquired about the gun, McDermott repeated his bird-shooting alibi. After a brief chat, Walsh announced his departure, and McDermott accompanied him partway across the lawn. Upon James' return, he confided with Grace that if Walsh had entered the house and seen the blood on the floor, he would have killed Walsh too. As James Walsh walked away, he wondered how Nancy could have been riding Mr. Kinnear's horse if he'd not yet arrived home from Toronto. It just didn't add up. Grace claimed that after Walsh left, James McDermott gave her the details of Mr. Kinnear's murder. James allegedly told her, 
that when she had refused to lure Mr. Kinnear out and was busy in the back kitchen, McDermott had called Mr. Kinnear to the dining room, telling him that his new saddle had been scratched and asked him to inspect it in the harness room. Mr. Kinnear, engrossed in a book, rose from the sofa, followed McDermott toward the harness room, a small room in one corner of the kitchen. McDermott then picked up the loaded gun and shot Mr. Kinnear as he crossed the kitchen, shooting Thomas point-blank in the chest. The killer couple began packing up all the valuable items they could find. Both descended into the cellar where Mr. Kinnear lay dead. Holding a candle, Grace said she watched as McDermott removed keys and money from Mr. Kinnear's pockets. Neither mentioned Nancy at the time, but Grace said she knew she was somewhere in the cellar. At around 11 o'clock that night, McDermott harnessed the horse, loaded the boxes into the wagon, and they embarked on their journey to Toronto. McDermott expressed his intention to escape to the United States and to marry Grace, to which she agreed. In his confession, James declined to say how Nancy Montgomery and Thomas Kinnear had died, but put the blame firmly on Grace. He said, quote, I frequently refused to do as she wished and she said I should never have an hour's luck if I did not do as she wished me. I will not say how Mr. Kinnear and Nancy Montgomery were killed, but I should not have done it had I not been urged to do so by Grace Marks. After Nancy Montgomery was put in the cellar, Grace several times went down there, and afterwards she told me she had taken her purse from her pocket and asked me if she should take her earrings off. I persuaded her not to do so, the gold snuff box and other things belonging to Mr. Kinnear she gave me when we were at Lewiston. Grace Marks is wrong in stating that she had no hand in the murder. She was the means from beginning to end. end quote. James also described how it was Grace who had gathered all the valuables in the house while he readied the horse and buggy for their escape. Upon their arrival at the City Hotel in Toronto at about 5 a.m., they woke up the staff, had breakfast, and Grace dressed in some of Nancy's clothes. They then caught the 8 a.m. boat and arrived in Lewiston, New York at around 3 p.m. There they checked into a tavern, Grace using the alias Mary Whitney. That evening they ate supper at the inn's pub and retired to separate rooms. Before going to bed, Grace told McDermott she would stay in Lewiston and not accompany him any further. He insisted that she would continue the journey with him. Meanwhile, a friend of Thomas Kinnear's who had an appointment to meet him arrived at the farm. Finding no one at the residence and blood on the floor, he raised the alarm. Nancy and Thomas's bodies were discovered in the cellar. A later autopsy would disclose that Nancy Montgomery was carrying a child when her life was tragically cut short. From the beginning, detectives suspected that McDermott and Marks were entangled in the horrific crime. James Walsh's story about what he'd seen confirmed the investigator's resolve to track down the pair. Grace and James were tracked to Lewiston around 5 a.m., less than 48 hours after they fled. Mr. Kingsmill, the high bailiff, arrested them and brought them back to Toronto. That was really fast. Well, because it, I'm trying to think, I, Lewiston, I don't know where it is, but I'm going to assume it's somewhere near Buffalo, right? Right, so, yep, yep. Kind of, so the police, they would have had to have gone, so they're up sort of north western toronto now don't think too hard on this so they'd have to go down and around well they took a ferry or oh, took the ferry straight across okay. yeah so they took the ferry yeah there's not a lot of people in richmond hill at the time right there's not a lot of couples taking the ferry at the time it was probably pretty easy to deduce okay. and track two suspected killers at the time the guy who worked the ferry might have even known them you okay know, you know what i mean yeah. like it's it's not like Toronto is now a city of 7 million people. Like nobody would ever remember anybody on any ferry. Right? No. Yeah. yeah, it's not like that. At their trial on November 3rd, 1843, James McDermott was found guilty and sentenced to hang on November 21st for Kneer's murder. Marks, who also received a hanging sentence the following day, fainted upon hearing the verdict, injuring herself when she collapsed. The Daily Herald reported, quote, in falling forward, one of the spikes surrounding the dock inflicted a wound in her breast, and although not of a serious nature, caused much pain, end quote. The all-male jury took pity on Grace Marks, and at the judge's insistence, her sentence was subsequently commuted to life imprisonment. Neither McDermott nor Marks was ever tried for the murder of Nancy Montgomery by the Crown. James McDermott was hung as scheduled. 
Grace Marks, spent a total of 29 years in various facilities, including 15 months in the Provincial Lunatic Asylum in Toronto. From Kathleen Kendall's article, Beyond Grace, Criminal Lunatic Women in Victoria, Canada, quote, Approximately eight and one-half years into her sentence, Grace began to exhibit signs of insanity. According to the medical register, kept by the prison surgeon, the insanity manifested itself in the following way. Quote, From being quiet, well-behaved, and industrious, she all at once became noisy and excitable, for several days displaying the highest state of exultation by singing, laughing, and rapid talking, which would be followed for a shorter period of gloom and despair. She has daily illusions imagining she sees strange figures invading her. She sleeps badly and wanders about her room for most part of the night in search, often, of the subject of her false visions. End quote. According to the Toronto Star, Grace held on to her story throughout her incarceration. As reported by The Globe in 1871, Marx insisted she had to help McDermott murder Montgomery or else she would have been the next victim. She also consistently stated that she was not involved in Kinnear's murder but did help to hide the crime out of fear. Some media outlets began sympathizing with her, and one reporter from the Globe even advocated for her release, noting her hard-working nature and the hope she held for her future. Marx was eventually pardoned in 1872 and moved to New York. After that, she disappeared from public records. Upon her release, when questioned about her involvement in the crime, she blamed her misfortunes on having worked in the same house as McDermott, whom she described as a villain. Today, a park near the site of the original crime exists near the intersection of Young Street and Elgin Mills Road. Marks never seemed to show remorse for her actions. Margaret Atwood's historical fiction novel, Alias Grace, is centered around the life of Grace Marks. Sarah Pauly announced in 2012 that she would adapt Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace into a feature film. This idea later transformed into a television miniseries, which aired on CBC TV in Canada in October and November of 2017, and is available globally on Netflix. Hmm. Grace's story is so interesting, people love to tell it. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, it's often told from that female perspective. Did you read Alias Grace? I have not read Alias Grace. So yet. I read it the year it came out. Sure. Okay. So that, so that was 27 years ago. Yeah, a long time I, ago. I, to be honest, I can't remember it. Mm -hmm. Like if you had like read this entire episode right. without mentioning it was Alias Grace. You might not have known. I, because I can't remember. And I, now I want to go back and read it again. Yeah. Have you seen the Netflix show? I have, yeah. Okay. I think I'll read it again before I go to the Netflix show. Yeah. How do you write the Netflix show? Eh. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> it didn't take off like Handmaid's Tale, that's for sure. No, it right? definitely did not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does it feel Canadian? You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I do know yeah. what you mean, and yes, it does. Production value. Okay. Well, a lot of the production value now, like, I mean, there's big movies made here. Yeah, but not with... If it's Canadian money, that's the problem. Yes, that's I, what I mean. <laughs> yeah, if it's American money made in Canada, looks fantastic. But if it's Canadian money, well... Sometimes. I once said to a creative in an ad agency I was working, I said, uh, the creative left thinking it was a good meeting. I'm like, the client said it was good production values. That means <laughs> that they have nothing else to say. Right. <laughs> but yeah, Canadian money doesn't go as far. No, it, def it definitely doesn't. The crews are the same crews. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're able to do fantastic things. Yeah, it's just they have to do it in a day instead of seven, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Been there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Even on larger budgets like Wicker Man. I'm so sorry for that. It wasn't horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you always like poo poo your Wicker Man experience, but it wasn't a horrible film. Well, there's worse ones that I worked on. Like uh, <laughs> there was a Steven Seagal film. Well, it's already worse, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. We don't want to get into it. It was called Kill Switch. And if you've seen it, all the action scenes, you'll see Steven Seagal's character from behind right. because I was hired as the second assistant director to uh, reshoot all the scenes because he was so lazy during principal ph 
photography. Wow. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you were hired as the body double. No, no. There was another guy who did it. I was like, I think he's a little bit taller than you. No, no. Yeah. He's, he's like six, five. He's yeah. a big guy. He, and, <laughs> I honestly thought you were going to say you were the body double. <laughs> no. And also he's a wiener, but, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for dark Protein episode 278 murder in Richmond Hill, the crimes of Grace Marks and James McDermott. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right, it's time for some voicemails. Let's listen to the first one. Oh, boy. Hey, Mike and Matthew. My name is Adam from a small village of Forkful, New Brunswick also known as the French fry capital of the world. It's the main headquarters for McCain Foods. I've been binging the library of Dark Poutine and listening to the new ones each week. I just finished listening to this two-part series of the murder of Diana Russell, and you guys were talking about what qualifies as life in prison and who should be paroled. I'm I'm all for people changing and becoming better humans, But the number one thing that should be considered is accountability. And that, to me, is probably the hardest thing for most of those animals in the cages to struggle with. But on the lighter note, I just want to say that you guys do awesome work and do a really great job on narrating all the dark and strange things Canadian. I love the show and keep the content coming. With that being said, take a big steamy in your beanie and have a great day. Take care, guys. I think we need to have t-shirts take a steamy in your beanie because... That would be great. Because people people have said that before, and I do find it amusing. It's interesting that he brings up that topic about life in prison and what it should actually be. And I think that's that should be part of it. If you don't take accountability of your crime, for your crime, you don't get out. End of story. End Absolutely. Of story. Like I, I totally agree with Adam on that. And also, here's a here's a controversial one, and this is one that a few families have brought up to me and uh, in the media. If you do not tell the families and the authorities where the body is after you've been convicted, you should also never get out of jail. Well, those two things are connected. Account- they, they accountability. They are. They are. I mean, you can still. I mean, you can still take accountability uh, of the crime if there's if the body has already been recovered. Yes. But yeah, I agree. It, they are definitely connected. And I think um, we saw it, for example, in the case of Lynn Duggan. Yeah. You know, uh, Cheryl is still wondering, you know, where the rest of her sister is. That scumbag won't say anything. Nope. And he, he's getting out. That's He's a, on parole. That, that, that is completely wrong. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah. it's just, I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> I'm putting my foot down, Mike. Matthew put down his big gay foot. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Adam. Pretty fly for a fry guy. Yeah, exactly. McCain's. Oh, yes. But he doesn't work at McCain's there. Well, what, Adam, where does it, he work? He's a whale song DJ. Oh, he's a whale song he, DJ. He remixes whale songs. You know what I learned the other day? I was sort of doom scrolling as I typically do. Mm. And I saw a story about sperm whales Mm -hmm. and apparently their clicks are so deep and sonorous Mm. that they can actually shake your body to pieces and kill you. Really? Yeah. If you're close enough. It's like a superpower. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So thanks for, uh, helping those whale songs uh, make sense in sort of a weird way. I want to go to a whale song nightclub Me where, too. where Adam is DJing. Yeah, it could be interesting. <laughs> Let's listen to our next voicemail. Hey guys, I just want to say uh, you guys do a killer job. Uh, I love your podcast and it's just really neat to see. I've listened from the start and it's really neat to see how far you've come from the beginning. Like, 
you sometimes you just come for the juicy bit to hear about these horrible, horrible things and wrap your mind around it. But it's really impressive to me how um, how you guys really bring the victims out and like humanize them and so watch through these people that these beautiful people that we lost and these poor families that have to deal with the outfall of it all and uh i just can't say you get enough that yeah you guys do a phenomenal job and uh uh i guess i forgot uh this is matt from calgary and i just guess go uh get in your hat have a good one guys bye thanks matt from Calgary. From Calgary. He's not Matt from Vancouver. That's he's not. Me. He's not a rodeo clown. What does he do, Matthew? What does he do? He uh, river rafting choreographer. Oh, there you. Oh, yeah. So we have DJs and choreographers. Yeah. So today. He, he like does like really cool river rafting choreography. Oh, so it's like he gets it's a not drone. just straight down the river. It's no, like, he gets a drone and a bunch of different rafts and, and creates like a little cool little patterns well, and that stuff. That sounds fun. Yeah. I want to see that. Do they have river rafting in Alberta? Sure they have river okay. rafting in Alberta. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, here is our third voicemail. Let's take a listen. Hi, Dark Poutine Podcast. Um, my name is Valerie and I am living in Long Island, New York. And I just wanted to compliment you guys on a really great podcast that is a great balance between your personalities and the subject matter that you talk about and humor and also learning. Um, and most especially, um, I've been listening for a while now, but I really did not, you know, being from America, did not know anything about the um, subject of your latest podcast, the, the Quebecois assembly shooting and I have to say as somebody who looks with dismay at the gun violence um, in my country and the um, thwarted efforts to try to roll back um, this insane um, everybody gets a gun and um, it was a little bit um, different to hear and it was very tragic, those three people who lost their lives, you know, essentially in service to their, um, to their state, um, that, um, it is, that was very tragic component. But I also want to say that the story of bravery and, um, people acting in a way to, um, you know, reduce loss of life and what happened um, was also heartwarming too. And it just shows that we can pursue a different path that with human nature, we have the ability to stop the same use of guns. Um, if we can have the bravery to do what that sergeant of our arms did, then we can sur surely have the, um, bravery in this country, I hope, to stop the proliferation of guns. And um, so I want to thank you for letting me know about that story. It's just was wild to watch the video and um, and keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, take a shit in your hat. Okay, bye. Thank you. I didn't expect the shit in your hat from Valerie, but uh, thank you so much. And and yeah, that was that was the most compelling thing for me, too, about the story was um, the bravery. Mm. of mr he's he's my new hero yeah, right <laughs> like when, when, when we did that podcast i saw the video i'm like wow yeah it, it wasn't storm troop in it was just a guy in an overcoat it's, it's, an unarmed guy and it's, so, it's in a, strangely very canadian yeah smoking in, in a, in a, a cigarette ways, and saying hey how you doing yeah <laughs> hey, how you doing yeah well, thank you, Valerie. So what does Valerie do for a living there in Long Island? You know what song I have in my head right now? What's that? Amy Winehouse. Why don't you come on over, Valerie? Oh, I like uh, Steve Winwood's Valerie as well. Okay. That's a good song. Uh, Valerie is the is a Montauk monster investigator. Really? Yep. 
Wow, that's cool. So she's probably not interested in the uh, Long Island serial killer who was no, she, very recently. She's dedicated to the Montauk monster. Well, good for her. Yeah. I like the Montauk monster. It's an interesting story. But anyway, <laughs> that's it for voicemails. And thanks, Valerie, and everybody else who called. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All righty, so let's move on to uh, Patreon and Donut Money Donut shoutouts. So this week we have one patron, and her name is Heather O'Neill, and Heather's from Monroe. Michigan. Monroe, Michigan. Monroe? Monroe, yeah. Hmm. What does Heather O'Neill do there in Monroe, Michigan, Matthew Stockton? She works for the auto industry. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Is there still an auto industry in Michigan? Yeah. Wow. I think so. I, I, I Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there is. I'm being silly. But she does special paint jobs on cars. Oh, wow. Oh, like custom jobs. Yeah. But, oh, okay. But like, she's like really talented. Like if you want sort of galloping horses along the side of your van. Yeah. You can get those or a big eagle. There you go. I don't know. I don't know if the auto industry is still going. It, there, yeah, it's not as strong as it used it's to be. Parts mostly, I yeah. think. Alrighty, so that is it for Patreon. Let's move on Thank to you, Heather. Donut Money Donors. And we have Melissa and Taya. And uh, Melissa sent us some donut money before, but she says, Hey, Mike and Matthew, Mel again just wanted to send some love to my OG true crime pod. Go shit in your hats. Purple uh, heart. Purple heart. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you again, Melissa. Yes. And what does Melissa do for a living? She's a generalist. A generalist. Where is she a generalist? <laughs> and what is a generalist, Matthew? She does general things. Okay, good. Yeah. For a general in the armed forces? No, just generally. Okay. She generally does general things, yeah, and so she's, she's a general. And, and she generally lives here and there. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. But that keeps her interesting. It certainly does. It's very mysterious, actually. Oh, it's not mysterious. It's general stuff. It's in front of you all the time. Oh. No mystery at all. It's just general. Okay. Well, thank you, <laughs> Melissa, I think. <laughs> wow. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it. Until next week. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Because there are enough of those already. Yeah, there's plenty of those, especially on Twitter. Twatter. <laughs> <laughs>